Huomenta vaan kaikille myös mun puolesta. So good morning everybody. Uh, I have a bit of a, if, if you wonder about my voice, I have like the most worst autumn flu, but I think we'll get, get through it today. Um, so today is about databases and we'll talk about databases and what are databases in the cloud. It's a really, really broad topic. So Uh, bear with us because there will be a lots of different areas that you could focus on. So you could focus on the relational side of databases. You could focus on the non-relational side. If you're studying the universities, the vocational institutes, you might be focusing on, for example, just SQL language. And the aim for today is to pull together those pieces and explain how they relate to the cloud and what you could do and how you could build your career around them. And um, let's get going. A uh, quick reminder, next one, the next set will be for webinars on 3rd of November. It's also a Thursday. So that's the development side of things. So it will be the Uh, developer tools and you will find the link on the slide uh, so um, you will have a very interesting session on that one we are also now planning many of you have asked uh, when is the next immersion day so the hands-on training we are now looking into setting the first one for this group for the same date so 3rd of november and we will let you know Uh, very soon, if it will be 3rd of November. There are also plans that some of the groups will have on-site uh, capabilities. So there are a few AWS partners who are hosting events for immersion days so that you can join us at the office. So we will have Helsinki, probably Uvascular. If I can, I will do Turku. And we have sites that will also have on-site support for you where you can go and practice together but you will get more insight on that one very soon. Um, before we talk about today's topic, uh, reminder, so what we are doing here, this is the basic fundamental training level of the technology training that we are doing together. So the webinar side, and this is the theoretical side. Then we'll do the immersion days, which are the hands-on part, and then we'll do the certification journey And as you've probably been seeing, a lot of people have now finalized their certifications from last spring. That's really cool to see. And, um, and we are also kicking off very soon the solutions architect side of certification journey. So, so there's basically two tracks at the moment. The cloud practitioner that, for example, this session is prepping for. And then there's the solutions architect side of things, which is the associate solutions architect. And um, it's very cool to see that people are also graduating from the first part of the year. And now we are starting the second part of the year, which is leading to more certifications. Um, quick intro. Uh, who am I? So my name is Ursula Koski. I'm a senior solutions architect. I'm actually a partner architect on the AWS uh, side. Um, my expertise or my kind of focus for the, um, if you look at my whole career, has been around databases. So I've been mainly working with relational databases, high availability environments, data analytics, and a maximum performance architectures. And what does it mean? It means that when you have a critical database, how do you keep the data available in all kinds of situations? If there's a war, if there's a critical scenario, if you lose, let's say there's a building fire, what do we do then? So how do we have a backup site? Or if there's an internet outage, what do we do then? So that kind of uh, maximum performance and availability. Um, <clears throat> I'm originally from Finland. Um, eli Suomen kielinen alun perin. Um, I've been traveling for about a decade, uh, almost straight before, before COVID hit. And then I returned to Finland. I love to read, live to travel, which was really tricky during COVID. And I'm also the leader of Clemson at Amazon, which is the LGTBQ plus network for, for the Nordic countries uh, and part of EMEA board uh, for the Clemson group. Uh, so if you see initiatives around Clemson, those are in that space. And uh, yeah, I have a colleague with me 
and I will hand over to Adamo so you can introduce yourself. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm uh, with Ursula, also working in AWS. I'm a solution architect. I have a little bit of different background. I come from the telecommunication and mobile communication background. So been in Nokia for 20 years uh, uh, as a technical lead, technical manager, te technology manager, working on architecture and, 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 and standard and process and things. Um, yeah, so I've kind of, my background has always been a system architect, an end-to-end -end architecture. And this is what I've also doing in AWS. Um, I come from originally from Ghana, but I've been living here for, almost 20 years now working in Nokia. So uh, pretty much my finish is pretty much basic because I've also been traveling, working uh, most of the time outside uh, Finland, but still living in Finland. Yeah, so I'm also a leader in one of the diversity and inclusion group, which is the Ben Black Employment Network. I'm also kind of a leader and also in the same kind of a Nordic diversity and inclusion group with uh with uh with with Ursula. Yeah, that's me and uh nice meeting you and I hope you have a great session today. <laughs> Thank you, Adamo. So I think let's kick off today's session and let's let's look at the basics of relational databases. And um I'm aiming to cover also the side of why I got into databases so much. So why did I choose to do my career around databases? So that's maybe to give you an understanding that, let's say, if you're wondering what to do after your studies, for example, or if you're wondering how to transform your career. So why was that my choice? And, you know, feel free to ask questions. So the chat is open, ask questions. Uh, if they are questions like, where do I find the documentation? Uh, we can easily drop those links into the chat. If there are much broader questions of, uh, understanding principles around the topics, uh, don't hesitate to stop me. So, so if you say like, I don't get it, why are we doing this? Like, what's the point? So please stop us and ask questions. And um, Adamu, if you see a question that we should tackle, you know, let me know. So, so okay. definitely we'll stop there. Um, let's jump into the databases and when it relates to relational databases. And we will not spend too much time in uh, like looking into what came before, but what is really good to know that there has been a lot of different kinds of pre-relational database theory database environments. So uh, when storing data, when changing data, when manipulating data, there has been a lot. So for example, if you, uh, if you know what punch cards, reika are, so uh, those are even like a precursor of a relational database. So they were one way of storing data and reading the data over and over again. Um, I would say that uh, coming up to the 1950s, there was a lot of different ways of storing the data. And uh, that actually, that storing of the data, collecting data, and, and also manipulating data was slowly getting into the area of, hey, how do we do this in a format that is predictable? How do we do this in a format where there are rules about, for example, what happens if a certain data has a relationship when it comes to another group of data? How do we keep that data intact? How do we guarantee it's only stored maybe once, for example? How do we get to the data quickly? And there was a lot of theories and <clears throat> slowly but surely, there were different companies that started evolving the database theory. And of course, the significance of the database theory grew. So even though it wasn't necessarily yet the relational database theory, but the ways of storing data evolved. So. I would go as far as saying that organizations started understanding that accumulating data was expanding rapidly. And actually, this is what we see even today. So organizations store data, uh, they use data, they manipulate data, 
uh, they transform it and they use it for something. So what that something is, is typically decision making. So you need to be able to uh, store the data reliably, get to the data consistently, and, and also uh, make valid business decision based on data. So it's very fundamental building block when it comes to um, the evolution of an organization. So if you look at traditional way of looking at databases, and if you look at the relational database side of things, uh, the, uh, the kind of traditional way of looking at those has been something like uh, something like this. So you might have uh, different silos of, let's say, orders. So your customers orders products, or let's say you have payments and how those are processed. You have reporting, you have invoicing, you have customer data. And that's a very traditional way of looking at data. And one thing that I actually didn't mention in the previous slide is that uh, when we look at the accumulation of data and we look at all the people on earth, the number from, from 2020 was around 1.7 megs per second that we produce data. That's quite something. So if you look at the amount of data that we're producing by taking pictures or sending messages or sending videos, uh, it was already that high 2020. And the amount of data per five years uh, is um, increasing by tenfold. So it's humongous the growth of data right now. And of course, what is contributing to that is the fact that we have a lot of uh, storing of data as pictures, as videos, etc. So um, looking at the traditional databases and data, there's a couple of things that you have to keep in mind. One is how do you actually see the data when it comes to uh, data being up to date? So is it up to date? Is it actually the data that is, that is now? Is it current? Is it also reliable? So are you getting the correct information at the correct time? How do you know the validity of data? Uh, so can it be used for the purpose? So for example, if you're aiming to do business decisions, is that data valid for that business decision? So is your assumption correct? Also, what is the significance of the data? Uh, so do we understand the data and is our understanding correct? And then we come to the part which, is, which has been a big part of my career is the availability of the data. So is it available at the correct times, at the correct speeds for the organization? And um, a digitalization of our data assets in organizations has grown significantly. So if you start from the, let's say 1920s, 1950s, et cetera, grow into the 1970s, there was a lot of data on paper. And <clears throat> when we started digitalization, so when we started using a lot of uh, hybrid media, so you might have printouts and uh, web-based products, uh, you have audio, you had video, et cetera. Also the amount of data has exploded basically. And when you look at the databases, uh, the purpose of any database is basically to have a persistent storage of data, a persistent data set that actually comes back to those basic principles of being reliable, being usable, being available. So um, when we talk about databases, we talk about something called DBMS, so database management systems. And database management systems can be a multitude of different products. So different kinds of storage systems, different kinds of languages of manipulation of that uh, storage system and restoring and getting the data on screen for your users. So <clears throat> users use that storage system and that data through that DBMS system. And that DBMS system actually provides a way to get those structures, get those data from the disk to the user. So what does happen when we talk about relational databases? So what is relational to the context of database management systems? So, <clears throat> <coughs> so 
So relational databases is actually a formal way of storing data uh, based on a mathematical theory, a set theory. And uh, those structures that we store are based on a re relational database model. And eventually they are actually stored as physical blocks on disk. Uh, but the theory itself is the processing model and the model, how do you build databases? And you have to remember that the theory itself and how different companies interpret that theory can be different. So you can have a relational database product that's, uh, for example, produced by Oracle or Microsoft, that SQL Server. You have open source databases, you have MySQL, you have different kinds of uh, products that actually create a model of how to build a relational database. And what's unique about it? You have features in the database, in the relational database theories on how a uh, database produces, um, uh, for example, uh, assumptions like data is stored only once in a, in a proper relational database format, but also designers and those who actually design the relational databases and structures and schemas can make decisions that may not align perfectly with the relational database theory or the set theory. So you can actually build it beautifully based on theory or then completely skip and ignore the theory. It depends on also the designer. Um, when it comes to relational databases, uh, the theory actually uh, was built in the 70s and it has two founding fathers. And, and those two founding fathers have worked for different companies. And one of the major companies that was involved in building relational database theory was IBM. So we have uh, Ted Cott or Edgar Frank Cott and Chris Date. Uh, Ted Cott is no longer with us, Chris Date is, and both of them are basically the founding fathers of relational database theories. And they have built a theory around how data is stored, how it's collected, how it's manipulated. One thing to keep in mind when you talk about relational databases is the fact that uh, when we use relational databases, when we design the relational databases, the structures we store the data in um, actually show you or answer the question of, of what you're getting to, what the data is that you're getting to. So, so in Finnish, that would be mitä kysymys. Uh, it's not the question of how. So if you look at the fundamental basic building blocks of relational databases, those are tables and those are the table structures and those are roles. And those rows are basically attributes. And then you have keys, you have columns, etc. And that's one way of building databases. And the relational database theory is definitely not the only theory, but it's the one that has the biggest market share when you look at databases and database-like products in the market today. So if you look at uh, very critical environments like hospital environments or payment platforms, very typically you do see relational databases in there. Um, and we don't have enough time to go through the, all the database theory today, but it's good to keep in mind that, yes, when you're storing data, you're actually answering the question of what you're storing or when you're getting to the data, is it, what, what are you getting to? So for example, if you wanna have customer data, Customer is the answer that you're expecting to get from the database, not really telling the database how you're trying to get to that. The how part is actually done by the manipulation language of that database. So we actually have two different theories when it comes to relational databases. One is the actual set theory, the mathematical theory, and the other is actually the uh, language theory on how do you be, uh, how do you build uh, data languages that can query the database. And those were built a bit later on. So <clears throat> if the relational database theory was built around 70s um, and finalized uh, at the end of 70s, um, then we got to the question of how do you get to the data 
and that was built around SQL. So how do you get the data? You need a query language. And once that query language theory was built, uh, that actually stabilized the situation with databases. So when we got to the 1980s, the fact that relational databases became so huge in the market chase, the fact that we had those both different theories, both the what you're storing and how you're getting to the actual data that you're querying. Um, so those are the fundamental two basic blocks. And how the companies will build on those theories is based on how the company sees the theory and how they interpret that theory. <clears throat> so uh, if the basic building blocks for relational databases are those tables, rows, and the attributes of those columns that we have those data in, what else? What is unique to the relational databases? We also have something called keys. And keys are used to build different relationships between the data. So, for example, if I have a human resources database and I have two tables, one is the uh, individuals working for the company. Uh, I have the basic data like last name, first name, uh, address, the department that they're working for. And then I have another table called departments. Uh, if I build relations between tables, um, that means that I will actually refer to another table using keys. And those keys are fundamental building blocks for relational databases. And those are one of those designing principles if you want to design tables, if you want to design databases. And before we get going with the actual uh, cloud side of things, one thing to keep in mind is that you have something called views. So you can also query the data in ready-made data sets. So you may have data sets that are built for you so that they represent multiple tables. So those are called views. And then you might, for example, combine your uh, human resources data with departments where you would see that Ursula is part of, let's say, partner organizations and SA team. And that's a view that represents multiple tables. So it can represent multiple tables. It can also represent just a part of a table. So um, I know that there's a lot of data that we could go through when it comes to relational database design, um, but I can also provide you with a bit of more data around the design process and how to do that also when it comes to cloud. But let's talk about a bit about operations and then let's talk about cloud. So, uh, like mentioned, SQL language is one of those fundamental areas that actually enabled relational databases. And operations are built on language which is standardized. And that standardized language is called SQL language. And SQL language, typically as a basic um, piece, is pretty similar in all of the relational databases. So if you're creating new tables or changing existing tables, or querying data, those are pretty similar in each and every, it doesn't matter if you're using Oracle, it doesn't matter if you're using a SQL Server. Um, what changes and what can be different is that when you get to more advanced features, so for example, if you're building procedural parts of the language, if you're doing very advanced grants in the environment, then you may see some difference. But the most fundamental piece, which is the SQL 92 standard, is something that usually all the companies that produce databases adhere to and, and, and use. So you can be pretty certain if you understand the basics, you will know how to use any of the relational databases. So that's a lot of data. And then let's talk about relational databases when it relates to cloud. So uh, what are the databases and relational databases in the AWS's cloud? And we talk about something called purpose built. And I kind of get the, I feel that I will get the easier part of today because I will just get to talk about the thing that I've been doing mainly, which is relational databases. And I, then I let Adamu talk about everything else, which is a lot. Um, but uh, let's talk about databases and what is purpose built. So one thing that we see on AWS's Amazon side is the explosion of data. So that tenfold increase every five years. 
So we see a lot of data flowing in, customers producing a lot of data, and we also see a lot of legislation changing. So as you can see, there's like GDPR, a regulatory side of things. Um, there's a lot of uh, what it comes to, how do you store, when do you store, and how do you secure the data? So explosion of data is humongous. And, and I'm trying to explain it to you this way. When I started my career, what seemed like a huge database at that time, when I was in my 20s, is seen as nothing at all. I have more uh, storage space in my phone right now than, than my biggest database was at the time. So the explosion is humongous. But what I also see is that customers don't always know what to do with the data. So how do you actually produce quality outcomes from that data? And when should they let go of data? And when should they hold on to that data? So that's one of the tricky parts of evolving now. Um, what we also see that is changing is that many services are split in microservices. So you might actually go away from the traditional model of having a humongous one monolith of an environment and actually splitting that environment and services into microservices level. So taking apart like messaging services, analytical services, um, storing of services into smaller pieces. And why is that? The reason is that when you have smaller pieces, you can also control the availability of those services individually. So if something fails, you can fix that service, not the whole huge one big stack of uh, products. And uh, what is also very much visible is that the rapid change um, is, is what's happening right now. So if you're a developer in this space, the change or and growth is amazing. So you should be always following like what's happening. Why would you adopt new technologies? Is it usable for your organization? And that's also what we are tackling here. So providing more educated workforce for partners and customers. And also, of course, for us is that how do you build those new capabilities? So that takes time. Um, when we talk about purpose-built databases, um, I, I take few customer examples, and I know that Adam has also uh, customer examples to share, but think about it in this way. So when you have that relational database, uh, that traditional way of storing data, it's very strong in certain areas. It's very strong in those availability, availability reliability areas. It's also very strong in the areas of understanding how different data sets refer to each other. Is it always the most performant one? No, not necessarily. So it's a very good transactional database. Uh, but why do you have so many different databases? So for example, if I take the example of customer of Airbnb, uh, they have used different database types. They use relational databases uh, for data types that need a lot of uh, data references. And they use it for their primary use of um, a transactional database. So when somebody queries like, where would I like to go on my holiday? That's the house I want to book, booking of that house. But then again, uh, it's not always the only way of doing things. So what they have noticed is that in order to provide that good customer service, they also need something called session state, and they have provided the service around that. So how to get to those uh, data sets really quickly, rapidly, that need to be closest to the uh, customer using that data set. And then again, how do you do, for example, user search history? But more about these um, when Adam is talking about purpose-built databases. But what do databases on AWS look like? So what do the relational databases look like on AWS and how do you build them? <coughs> so as a traditional model, if you look at the left side of this screen, uh, traditional way of building databases has been the fact that um, you have introduced all the functionalities and you have probably built the whole stack yourself. So, uh, for example, for my work history, it's been very traditional for me to start building from let's buy hardware 
let's get the network installation guys on site and getting those installations done. Let's get the electricians on site and get the electricity running. And then everything is built on top of that. So let's install operating systems. Let's uh, install DPMS. Let's do the building of the databases. So the relational database models, et cetera, et cetera. How do you patch? How do you scale? Everything is built from scratch. What changes and what can change is the fact that which part do you need to build yourself, install yourself, and which part is the part that AWS is doing for you. So we do fully managed uh, database services on AWS. And those fully managed services include, for example, if you want to provision a completely new database. So let's say I'm provisioning a new Oracle database uh, 19C something something version, I can do that and let AWS do most of the heavy lifting. So of course the hardware is provided to you from the cloud environment. You can decide how much and how big of a hardware you need. And then of course, patching, backup, recovery, et cetera, is built in. So you actually get, the, uh, get those features automatically given from the cloud and also uh, things like planning for the failover. So do you want to do databases that can fail over from one availability zone to another or for even failing over from one region to another? So for example, if I'm building a database in Stockholm, I can decide that my recovery site is, for example, uh, let's say it's Frankfurt. I can build that using the AWS side of things, which is almost completely automated. What is not automated is the decision making process. So nobody's going to make that decision for you that will you need that failover site. And why is that? The fact is that if you will have a failover site, that will also incur a cost. So if you decide that your environment is critical enough to need a failover site, you will need to make that business decision but the capabilities are there. And also what we don't do is that if you decide to build on a specific region inside a specific country, for example, we don't make that decision for you that we would take your data somewhere else. So that's not happening because you need to make that decision yourself because you also understand the legislation that goes into the database and the database site management. Um, so keep in mind that there are a lot of business decisions that go into planning those databases in the cloud environment. So what is actually left for you if you decide to use cloud for building of those databases? So you have to think about the purpose you're building those for. So for example, if you're building a database and doing a completely new data set, you would do the schema design, the relational database design. You would think about what kinds of queries you will run and what kinds of query optimizations you would do. And <clears throat> if you remember um, what we talked about in the fundamental set, we talked about the security in and off the cloud. It is still very much your duty to decide how do you secure your data? Meaning that, for example, if you need to encrypt some of the data in the database, that is your business decision to make. What we will do for you when it comes to encryption, everything that goes into the AWS network or traverses the AWS network is encrypted by design. So all the data flowing through the network is encrypted, but we will not encrypt your database structures if you do not decide to do so. So uh, remember that there are some capabilities that are built in, but then there are business decisions that you need to take yourself. So if you look at the common data model, so what I'm talking about is the most traditional one, and that's the relational side of things. So relational use cases. And what does that mean uh, typically? in the context of AWS is that relational use case would be you have data that is split among tables. And those tables follow the relational database theory. It is typically highly structured data. 
and relationship between data uh, data sets are established via keys, primary keys, foreign keys, uh, key value uh, types of setups. Uh, you have the data accuracy and consistency enforced by the system and built by, as mentioned, relational database theory. So, and you will use a manipulation language, which is the SQL language to get to the data. And one thing is that we have a lot of different flavors of relational databases that you can use and you can decide to build your projects on. So let's have a look. What, what do we have? Oh, come on. So we have something called Amazon RDS. So it's a managed relational database service with a lot of choices between different database engines. So we have most traditional ones. So you have Oracle databases with different versions and different batch levels. And it comes with the same set of uh, features as all of the RDS products. So you have the batching, you have the availability set up. So for example, are you doing multi-AC? Are you possibly doing a failover site in a different region? Um, and it's very scalable, so you can decide to start small and then scale up. We also have SQL Server, we have MariaDB, Post, uh, Postgres SQL, MySQL, and then we have something called Amazon Aurora. And I was thinking I might actually spend a few moments talking about Amazon Aurora, uh, because it is actually our fastest growing product um, throughout actually AWS's history. So it's a relational database that comes with uh, different flavors and it has a very interesting feature set. And I could spend a moment talking about it. And if we have time today, I might actually demo something for you. Um, but whatever flavor you decide to use uh, or decide to move to the cloud, these are all relational databases. And these produce in some way, shape or form also SQL query language. They might have some unique features and the unique features means that if you're deciding to build on, for example, Postgres or Oracle, you might have tiny differences. And those tiny differences um, happen when you actually use more advanced features. For example, if you're using procedural SQL code in the database, it might have some unique features. So they might not be completely one-to-one. -one. Uh, when you do performance tuning, you have to understand how do you performance tune on Postgres? How do you performance tune on Oracle? And also, for example, features like, let me give you an example. How does that relational database engine handle uh, case sensitivity or insensitivity? So for example, if you write the table name as uppercase, is it different than writing the table name in lowercase? So there might be some small functional differences in there, but they are all relational databases. They all use SQL language, but they all have unique features. So uh, why did I choose to talk about Amazon Aurora is the fact that it, it's like mentioned is one of the most uh, fastest growing, it's the fastest growing product for AWS. It's very scalable and it's relational. And um, so it actually comes with two different flavors. So it hosts uh, MySQL engine and PostgreSQL engine, but it does some things very uniquely. So it does scalability, uh, it does uh, the isolation part, uh, like network isolation, encryption, uh, encryp encryption at rest and transit a bit differently. It is managed server. So it's a managed server in ways that it provides you with the automated patching processes, monitoring processes. Uh, it provides you with the configuration setups and backups that you can fine tune, of course, but they are given to you so that you have a full feature user interface available. And then there's actually something that's really unique is the availability and durability. So how do you do fault tolerance? And how do you do, for example, self-healing if you need to do some self-healing given that there's an outage somewhere, for example. So what is different if you compare it to uh, Aurora, uh, like traditional database architecture 
to Aurora and Aurora type of setup in the cloud. So let's have a look. So traditionally relational databases are seen as being all about IO. So if you look at the last 40 years, um, there has been pretty kind of standardized uh, design principles. If you increase IO, meaning that you increase the bandwidth, uh, or you decrease number of IOs consumed. So the, meaning that if you decrease number of IOs consumed, so decreasing the amount of data queried from the database is actually a performance tuning option. And that decreasing can be done by using the SQL language, uh, optimizing your language, using, for example, indexes uh, in the environment, or then using something very purpose-built, like very much uh, database-driven architectures on hardware that you actually do uh, like pre-sorting or pre-querying before you actually move the data from storage to the front end of the products. So somewhere you're actually optimizing by decreasing the number of IOs that you need to consume. Or the other option is that increasing the pathway, increasing the pathway uh, from the storage to the front end. So how do you increase that bandwidth of getting more data through uh, those lanes that you have available? Those have been the very, very traditional um, performance tuning options for relational databases. What about if you do something different? So if you look at the cloud and what is unique, is the fact that in the cloud, um, there's a lot of functionalities built in. And when it comes to Aurora, um, and also some of the RDS features that we have also for Oracle, SQL Server, the plain MySQL and Postgres, uh, there are patterns that we can use. One is that uh, basic pattern of if one instance fails, if one computer fails, that's processing database uh, workloads, how do you actually replace those? And how do you replace those quickly? What happens if somebody accidentally shuts down an instance? Can you forbid uh, admins from doing that if it's a production workload? So how do you actually forbid accidental shutdowns? How do you scale up and down your instances? So giving those more traditional ways of providing more bandwidth or actually querying a lot less uh, the capabilities built in the cloud? And how do you actually add instances if you have to do the horizontal scaling out of your databases? So adding more processors uh, to your workload so that you have more machines processing your database workloads. So actually what we built when it comes to Amazon Aurora and it comes to MySQL and Postgres, we actually built something that decouples those features of scalability, availability, and durability. And we built it as a model that splits between storage and splits between the front end. So it looks like something like this. So we built it um, on principles of serverless. And today we actually do have a serverless Amazon Aurora. So we actually took the database structures and we split the storage from the front end and gave them the opportunity to scale out individually. So what happens on the storage side, we actually use SSD disks. Uh, so we use very fast disks on the storage side. Uh, we have a so-called continuous backup. So continuous backup means that in any case, in any scenario, the worst uh, scenario that you could see uh, with this type of setup would be the loss of five minutes of transactional data. Five minutes meaning that if all possible disaster scenarios would happen at once, uh, the continuous backup may not cover the last five minutes. Also, the storage is striped out across hundreds of storage nodes uh, in different facilities. As you remember, we have regions and then we have availability zones. Those stripes go across the same regions, different availability zones in different size blocks. And that allows us with a lot more security. And actually we have multiple copies and let's talk about the multiple copies very soon. So those piece sizes are actually 10 gigs uh, per piece. And we actually host six copies of the data 
at a given time continuously. And then we have something called purpose-built lock structure, uh, which is also distributed across the multiple facilities. So that's Amazon Aurora storage site. So six copies of the data, two in each availability zone to protect against if there's availability zone loss or failure. And that data segment or piece is uh, uh, divided in 10 gig pieces, protection groups. We call them protection groups. And um, so each protection group contains six of those 10 gigs uh, pieces and two of the copies are always in one availability zone and then we have multiple availability zone underneath. Uh, we can automatically scale out the storage so we can scale out the storage across those um, protection groups uh, automatically up until 128 terabytes for that given storage. So it has quite a unique, quite a robust architecture in there. So that provides us with the high durability storage system for those given databases that are utilizing Amazon Aurora. And it still is relational database. It still is using the SQL language that most of and every type of relational database engine is utilizing in some shape or form. And it's a self-healing architecture. So if we would have a failure in one availability zone, we have a self-healing uh, self -healing functionality that allows that availability zone to recover automatically. There's something called a COSI protocol, and that COSI protocol is used across the availability zone. So it actually gossips across the availability zones if one of them needs healing, it can actually automatically kick it off without any human intervention. So if that would happen that the availability zone three would have issues, the gossip protocol would kick in and actually start the healing processes across the zones. So what does the front end then look like? So Amazon Aurora as a relational database uh, is a clustered database and clustered in this context means that it can have multiple uh, data heads, front end heads, but one of them is a writer and the rest of them are readers. So you can have up to 16 database instances or nodes in one regional cluster and those span and can span over multiple availability zones. And one of the uh, nodes is always the primary, but you can switch the primary also based on if you just want to test the functionality, you can switch the primary when you decide to switch the primary. So it doesn't even need any recovery scenario. You can just decide to switch it over. And um, storage volumes beneath those, the storage volumes beneath that we talked about and those functionality of protection groups and those striping is shared with the readers, but the readers attach to those groups um, by read-only option. So for MySQL, it would mean that that's read-only, that's true one, or Postgres would mean transaction read-only is on, so it doesn't uh, actually manipulate the storage from those nodes. But those reader nodes can always be used for querying the data from all those access points. So they can be used for offloading processes to multiple readers. So when you access your uh, relational Aurora databases, it means that you may have multiple endpoints. So you may have endpoints that are writer endpoint, and then you have reader endpoint or endpoints. So you can also combine reader endpoints as one. So it actually does the scaling of those workloads across those readers. Or then you can use the writer endpoint to actually manipulate the data underneath. And if you're having multiple reader endpoints in one uh, endpoint, it means that it use, uh, uses load balancing features to span those reads out to those readers. So it's it's doing a round dropping process of, of doing the, the querying across those endpoints. And those endpoints are based on DNS entries. So there is a DNS in between. It's a fully qualified domain name that the readers and writers are attaching to. 
if there's something happening that our primary writer would fail for some reason, we can actually fail over that writer endpoint and promote any of the reader endpoints to become writers. So you have the functionality to completely switch out of an availability zone and immediately, immediately switch over to a new writer node. So any reader node can be promoted. You can also decide in which order they will fail over if you need to do so. So you can have also priorities attached to those. So you can attach priorities or then you can just point out and say, this writer will be my reader uh, going forward. <clears throat> so failover tier determines the preference of failover reader candidates. So the lower the value, the more preferred that node is. <clears throat> and basically it means that you will have accessibility, you have that reliability built in to your relational database from the platform up. So you have that divide between storage, front end, and the different network endpoints, and the functionality decide if you need to fail over also manually, that's an option. So I know that there's a lot of data when it comes to relational databases. And one of the best ways of practicing this is actually when we get to the immersion days. So once we get the immersion days dates out, uh, we will be having one immersion day that's completely reserved for databases. Uh, that is split between, also like this session will be split between relational databases and non-relational ones. So for example, if you know that you want to be focusing on more on relational databases, you can decide to uh, do more exercises on those on immersion days. Or if you want to do both, you can do both. Or if you want to prefer the non-relational side, you can also do that in the practice session. So it's up to you, what do you want to do? When you look at the certification exams, there is a heavy focus on when it comes to a relational databases. So I would even go as far as saying that half of the test uh, of the database side of the test when you're doing, for example, architect uh, level of, of certification test, when it comes to databases, handles relational databases. So that segment that handles databases, probably half of it is relational databases and half of it is everything else. So non-relational, different kinds of structured models of storing data but you have to know the whole uh, options in order to, to go through the certification process. If you're doing the fundamental side, I would say put more focus on the relational side than on non-relational side. You have to have an understanding of the non-relational, but if you get a database question, most likely it will be around relational databases more. But uh, at this point, uh, I think what I will do I will stop here and we'll see if we have uh, time after. We may do a bit of demos. If we don't, then, then we'll do those in the immersion days. But I think at this point, I will hand over to Adamu. If, uh, and also, Adamu, do we have any open questions that we need to cover before we jump in the non-relational side? Yeah, uh, no question yet. Uh, there's no question in the chat room. So Okay, cool. We can just, yeah. And, and I can monitor the chat if there's any questions. So, um, but yeah, uh, Adamu, please go ahead. Yeah, so maybe I share the screen here. Yep. Um, uh, hold on. Do you see my screen? Yes. So hold on, and then I would. Uh, is it on in presentation mode? Yes, I think so. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Uh. So hello from Tampere here, and um. I would. I have a no relational database to cover, and as Ursula said, we have more than fifteen purpose-built non-relational databases. So uh, I'm trying to make it in 45 minutes so that you have a, a demo from Ursula for, for the rest of the 15 minutes. So I'll probably go a little bit fast, faster than usual, but uh, I will try to uh, limit the time to 45 minutes. So 
uh, I, I may not be able to cover everything, uh, but uh, whatever I'm able to cover, you have the slides later on in the in the links to uh, this. Thing. But the most important thing I want you to get is about the data model, the access pattern. Why do you want to choose this database and what is it for? The rest, I mean, you can slowly get to it. So a wise uh, a guy said, uh, like my previous co uh, my colleague, uh, the previous presenter, said, uh, just try to pick your level of data that suits you. Nobody knows everything. And it's very true with the database, uh, the, the purpose-built databases here that we are going to talk about. Just be merciful on yourself. It's a journey. I mean, I'm going to talk about a lot of database. Some of them, like the ledger database, I've never used before, you know. But I'm with the idea that whenever I get to that, I have to use, depending on the application I'm using, I will use it. And then because uh, it's a journey and you learn when you are using it. So no relational database, we always, what is no relational database? I tell you, you heard a lot about relational database, how it's designed and everything. But basically it's also called as no SQL. So that means we don't follow that strict accuracy and consistent kind of design structure and strong schema uh, 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 that we've come to know about a uh, relational database. Just, uh, just to emphasize or uh, what uh, Ursula said uh, earlier, you can do pretty much anything with relational database. I mean, that's even what is, that has been, has been happening till now, you know? But for some use cases, I mean, they are really not the best tool. That does not say that relational base is not good. Relational database is doing good and is good and will always be good for certain specific use cases that has been designed for. So right now, the attempt to meet the modern day uh, kind of uh, development, modern day application requirement is how do we model different database to meet that specific requirement? This, I think, also has shown, I will not kind of uh, uh, spend more time on that, but basically it shows that in, previously we model every application based on relational database model. So that means you have the database model and you try to fit your application into that database model. So you are working like backwards. How you store the data, what data format, and then go upward. How do you develop your application to meet that requirement? Any kind of a requirement. But now, what we see now, you always start from the problem area down to the solution. But, but what we see now with the modern real application is that the performance scale and availability requirement are quite different. If you look at e-commerce, media streaming, social media, they have different characteristics, different perform performance uh, uh, requirement and availability. You are looking at 1 million plus users storing huge data volume, terabytes, betabytes, and you are looking at serving global and then the latency, sometimes micro latency, and then some of the requests are millions per second. And then when you look at also the, uh, 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 the assets, you know, you have mobile assets, IoT as a device assets. So you have different kind of requirements that are kind of uh, on these modern applications that we, uh, you see around. And then you have an issue about how do you scale up, scale down or scale in and out, and then the different models. So this has completely changed, I mean, how to store your data and how to interact with your data to be able to serve this requirement. And, and it has also completely changed modern day development. And people like Ursula said, people are moving, developers are moving to microservices architecture. So for a simple application, like let's say e-commerce or, or let's say uh, 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 web, uh, web store, you, 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 you you cannot de develop that monolithic application anymore because different parts of the application are kind of independent components have independent requirements. So you, the microservice architecture, like the web store, you want to develop the purchasing, you want to develop the order, the recommendation, you want to develop. And these are all different services that can be built by different team in terms of microservices. And the team should are given the flexibility to choose the database that fit their service as part of the application. Like the recommendation, you, you, you have to do recommendation based on relationship of the activities that is happening or entities in, in, in your web store. So you can see that you really need a graph database to be able to support your service. And somebody doing the search 
part of the uh, service uh, application will need a full kind of a, a search engine like Elasticsearch to support that. So every different kind of uh, uh, services that are part of this main application will need a different purpose built uh, data, database to serve them I mean, in terms of performance and efficiency. So that's why the need and the importance of the uh, 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 kind of um, purpose built relational database has increase and now I will say you cannot do without them. So you really have to, uh, uh, the right tools for the right job. And then our, the common data models, we also have shown this slide so I will not stay on this slide for long because I'm trying to go cover as many as possible, but these are the common data models and use cases. So what I said earlier on is that before you have relational database for everything. So you have like a a specific data model, a specific uh, kind of a structure and schema that you need to uh, adhere to. Then you move upwards to how do I build my application to meet this specific database, specific requirements. But now you start with your application. What model do you want your application to uh, interact with? How do you model your application? What are the data model that your application will interact with? And then what are the different requirements on, on, on your application? Then you move backwards. Oh, what will be the suitable purpose-built database that will fit my application and serve my application? And um, when we come to cloud, we talk about scalability, we talk about durability, and then we talk about also uh, 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 what do you call the, the performance area. So that is other part of the deployment issue that you may think about when you are considering a database. But simply key value is that you are storing your data as key value pair. So whatever you store, whatever they are all attributes of your data, are all key value pair, as simple as that, you don't need any more requirement. It's a very simple key value store. And then you have the document. So for some time you have an application that you are developing an application, that application requires to deal with the document, actually natively, like a JSON document natively, like profile, you want to store, retrieve the profile. So why do you have to build extra logic, a business logic to be able to turn this profile into a document. So you go directly to which database store documents for me and I can manipulate document in that database. And then you have in-memory. We talk about latency. You want fast uh, uh, retriever, fast response, or you have a graph database that the application you are trying to develop or the service you are trying to build heavily depends on relationship between the entities or the uh, uh, elements that you stored in the database. So what kind of database? So we have all these huge kind of uh, purpose-built database that serve different service needs and requirements that you can select based on your service requirement. So I will not go into this, but what I want, because I cannot go into all the details of these different types of purpose-built database and their common use cases and, and data models, I will just talk a little bit about key value use case and then talk a little bit about the AWS service for key value use case, which I believe mostly you come into contact with if you are building no SQL database within AWS because it serves a lot of common use cases. So the key value use case is simple key value pairs, according to the name. You, uh, you have the partition keys, which I mean, we will see how you uniquely identify each element in, 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 the, in, in, in the table. So, and then this is built in such a way to scale unbelievably at a very large scale and still keep the performance that uh, you require and give you low latency, really low latency kind of a response. Uh, so rapidly changing environment. And also with, because of the key value uh, nature of the, of the distance, you can have different attributes for different uh, item in the table. For example, like uh, you can search and, and retrieve, you know, the attribute, one single attribute, as uh, as you look at a search, uh, 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 this you can search the, the key and then the attribute that you want to retrieve, or you can retrieve the whole kind of uh, item from the table. I mean, of course, it doesn't support, this is a simple flat kind of key value pair. It doesn't support complex queries. If you want to do complex joins, then probably relational database is what you mean. You will be kind of uh, appropriate for you to use. So what kind of key value uh, pair database do we have in, in, in AWS? We have Amazon DynamoDB. I, I think you hear this name a lot. 
because it serves a lot of use cases when it comes to web, when it comes to mobile, when it comes to a kind of gaming applications and things because of the latency and, 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 and the scale. So it performs at scale. That means we are looking at single digit millisecond response time. And at every scale, so like, I mean, it scales uh, and then the performance scales as, as you scale. And, uh, and then you feel like you have unlimited throughput. I mean, uh, virtually a limited trouble because of the scalability of, of this database. And, uh, and that goes to uh, being the serverless architecture of it. You know, I mean, the serverless allows you the uh, unlimited scaling, unlimited throughput, but the architecture, when it's serverless, you don't have to provision hardware or software, or you don't have to do any purchase or upgrade. And, and it's automatically scaled based on your load. Uh, and then has your uh, does the uh, automatic backup for you. So what do you do? You just have to build your table and then kind of uh, 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 use it depending on your load. What we didn't discuss earlier on is how to provision your database. How what is the right kind of size of the database to provision? You don't want to over provision because then you are kind of violating the cost optimization uh, 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 well architected uh, framework. Or if you're under provision, you run into problems. With this serverless, none of these, you don't have to think about none of this. Just kind of skills based on your load or your throughput that you, you want for your application. It's also kind of a, 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 a it has enterprise grid security, encrypts data at rest and, a, a, and in transit. And the nice thing about it is you can build a global database with the Dynamo, which I will, I will kind of uh, uh, emphasize, uh, talk a little bit. I'm spending a little bit more on Dynamo here because I think for simple application, web application, fast application, a mobile application, most of the application, gaming application, web store, you will use Dynamo. So probably it's best to talk a little bit about Dynamo here. But again, start from your application and see what, what are your needs. What is your access pattern? What is your storage? What is your data format? And then choose a database, you know? So like I said earlier on, it scales quickly. And we don't, uh, of course, you don't need complex joints. We, we have RDS for that. And then, I mean, it kind of uh, the storage, high volume storage, we are talking about high terabyte range and the throughput, high throughput load latency. So this is like a gaming application where you are keeping a leaderboard, the leaderboard changes and you have like 300 million users active and you have like thousand requests per second. This is the kind of database that uh, kind of self, saves you, uh, uh, saves your requirement. Rapid changes, rapid update, low latency. Uh, and it's a no SQL table. That means what it means is like you don't have strict schema. So, what you put here, I'll talk a little bit about data model here a little bit. The different items or different row can have different kind of columns or attributes that we call it. And like you, like I said earlier on, it supports peaks of more than 20 million requests per second. So this is the, 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 the kind of database you want to have when you're having real time kind of update uh, and then real time kind of uh, uh, visualization of your update. So a little bit about, uh, so now, a little bit about the data model. Like I said, it's no SQL data model. You don't have strict schema, what it is. So in the table, you create a Dynamo table. The Dynamo table is kind of, uh, uh, it's a collection of data elements and then each entry is an item. So like an item, within an item, you, can, uh, you have data elements stored as what? Attribute, and this attribute are key value pairs. And you can have any number of attributes uh, in, in, in each item. You do, it's not strict. So each item may have variable length of uh, 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 number of attribute. So that's the flexibility there, you know? And then uh, what you have is that you partition it, user-defined keys that you use to partition it. And we'll talk about uh, hot partition, how to partition this, but this comes later. Like I, I talk about pick your level and go with it. Like, what, how do you do partition? What, what, how is the partition strategy to avoid hot partition? We'll talk about that later, but what you need is this, how do I uniquely define my item, the items in my table? So use partitioning, what we call a hash case, and then the sort case in terms of a second level descent. And then you can query based on the partition key, but Dynamo also 
allow you the flexibility to query the data beyond with non-primary key like a secondary uh, uh, like a global and local secondary index that you can use to query the data so what we have here for example if you have like order table right the only requirement in terms of uh, 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 I, uh, each item you put is user ID and other ID that you have in all the items here. Some of the input you may have uh, email address, you may have different kind of key value pair, and in some input you may not have those, but that is okay, and that's the flexibility of Dynamo. So when you are designing a table, you create the uh, primary key, which is the partition key, and then but when it comes to the attribute, you may be adding data input in the data uh, in the table and come up with some new attribute that you haven't thought about in the beginning. But then it's okay, you add it. Because that is not like street schema like uh, before. So that is what Dynamo data model has for you. And that's what the flexibility you, you will get with the Dynamo data, uh, database. So uh, I hope you understand the data model here because it's very important. I mean, this allows you to, uh, uh, this allows and give you the flexibility to build your database uh, anyhow you want. Uh, and then you can also give you the flexibility to query uh, uh, any, uh, uh, use different keys to query your database, right? And then still on Dynamo, you have your data model, you have your, you, you create your table, you have different things. How, uh, one thing about Dynamo is also you, you can create a global table. For example, you have user profile, you have a service with user profile in the US, like somewhere US West 2. And then you, you have also a, a user profile in the US is one, a US is a, a EU central. So you have people that are using your uh, service in different places and they are creating a profile. With Dynamo, you can create a, a global database by what? You create a database, you can create, uh, uh, enable the Dynamo streams, and then you can select which region you want that global database to be replicated. And then the Dynamo is as simple as selecting the regions when you are creating the database uh, after enabling the stream, create the global data. Dynamo will do the rest of the work about automatic replication, keeping all the state of the data up to date. So when you change one, Dynamo will do the replication or do the uh, uh, propagation of the changes to all this uh, database. So then you have a global database. You don't have to build your own replication. You don't have to maintain it. Dynamo will do that for you in case you need uh, uh, replication in different regions. But Dynamo itself is a regional service. And that means your copy of the data is a different availability zone within your region. But in case that requirement is needed, Dynamo will provide this multi-region, multi-master kind of database for you so that uh, you have fast read and write uh, kind of uh, performance. Again, uh, uh, still the Dynamo, one of the use cases that, uh, like I mentioned, uh, a game is used in a lot of gaming applications so, and a lot of real-time applications where you may have like 300 million registered users. So you may have like, we are talking about thousands, hundred thousands per second request and the leaderboard changes quickly based on the points you earn and, and based on the points you win or lose. And this needs to be reflected to the active game, uh, active um, active users that are playing the game. So we are talking about uh, a massive uh, uh, kind of a request handling, uh, low latency, high throughput. And these are the kind of, uh, 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 the kind of uh, characteristics or requirements of the database that uh, you want uh, from Dynamo, which gives you. I hope uh, um, uh, 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 this is one example, but with any web application that you want to store key value pair and just query it quickly or rapidly changing uh, attribute, Dynamo is the listen to use. So I put this one a little bit just to explain a little bit about consistency, eventual consistency. So we talk about fast response, low latency, high throughput. And we talk about huge numbers like uh, uh, 100,000 requests per second, 20 million requests per, per second. So what is the consistency options then in Dynamo? So by consistency, we mean, how do you read or update a kind of operation, reflect on a data item 
reflect on the on your read operations of the same item. So for example, when you read a data that has been recently updated, or what do you get? Do you get the, the new updated data or you get or you may get stale data or data that has not been updated? So by default, Dynamo is eventual uses eventual consistency. That means it uh, will be eventually consistent within one second. So that means when you read immediately on the data that you, because it's designed for fast response, high throughput. So the data may not propagate for you to, you know, it gives you fast response, but maybe you know wait for the data to propagate for you to get the latest data. That's within a second. That's it by default. So that is the kind of eventual consistency of Dynamo. You get a fast response in, in trading off with the kind of uh, latest kind of uh, uh, update that you get on the data. But Dynamo also has an optional feature that you can set when you are doing get item or query or scan, you have optional uh, read consistency parameter that you can set to true. When you set it to true, that means Dynamo ensures that you get the latest up-to-date uh, 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 write or update of any data that you read. So that means you ensure that strongly consistent uh, uh, data there. So you can you can you can you can make that choice. If uh, a strongly consistent is very important for you, then you can select that uh, flag flag that through for for that option. And then. Um, yeah, without, you can't talk about uh, any service in AWS without security. So these are different types of security that is recommended that to follow. The normal IAM rules to authenticate access and IAM policies. I mean, you can define fine green access based on the table or even the items in the table because tables are a collection of items or even within the item attribute level, you have that, uh, uh, what do you call it, that possibility to do that. And you are recommended to do that to ensure a uh, least privilege kind of uh, principle. If, uh, and you, when you are assessing Dynamo from uh, uh, VPC, recommendation is to use VPC endpoint. And um, yeah, so also uh, uh, Dynamo by itself comes with, uh, by default, encryption both at rest and in transit. So, like uh, 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 Osula mentioned, anytime you communicate with it, obviously, and out. It's encrypted in terms of transit, but that will also come in addition. In addition to that, that will come with uh, encryption at first, right? So, um, so this is a little bit uh, deep about Dynamo because uh, I think it's a it's this most popular use cases that you will encounter in terms of no SQL and in terms of modern day application. But again, start with your application and see what database kind of uh, fit your application. Another use case is a document use case. You may have an application that you want to manipulate document directly. You know, you want to store document, you want to query document, and you want to index a kind of JSON kind of type of document natively. For example, you have a profile. Within the profile, it might contain different elements, different attributes in the profile. You want to update that profile. You want to search for that profile. So that means you have an application that you want to insert the profile, you want to search the profile, and you want to index the profile. So for that kind of application, you need a database that stores things in a document format for you that you can easily manipulate. You don't have to build a middleware or complex kind of a, a business logic or application logic to be able to handle that one. And that is where you look at what we call a document DB, a database that kind of a, a, a store the data in a document format for you or form for you to be able to manipulate. And Amazon Data Document DB is kind of a highly available MongoDB compatible database services. So that means, I mean, like, I mean, this is fully managed for you. I mean, you can do millions of requests per second. I mean, these are the features, same code, same drivers and tools that you use for MongoDB. And then uh, what else? You have two times throughput and secure and compliant and deeply integrated with Amazon uh, AWS services. That means deeply integrated. That means you can just click and, and connect the endpoint to some of the services you are using. That means you can use your IAM, AIM kind of policies to, to control access and authentication. So it's deeply uh, so uh, integrated with AWS service. So that's what you are talking of about. Again, from your application, from your use case, you decided, am I using document? Am I manipulating document? What database can I use? 
and how and then there is a case where I mean you are looking for extremely low we are talking about microsecond to millisecond responses for applications or your service and then we are looking at millions of read and write so it's this kind of high throughput you know and we are looking for high kind of a, 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 a scale over 100 terabytes and above you know and in that case mostly if you have uh, you use like a cache layer and then cache layer is most like you keep the data most frequently query data most frequently as data you keep them in your cache layer which is like in memory layer it's not in the disk it's in the main memory of your or, or, uh, or, or, of your workload you know and this provide you the means to kind of um, read the low latency about your reading getting the results and and also uh, uh, manipulating the result and with this caching we will uh, we'll talk a little bit about what is the caching strategy how do you make sure that you have the uh, up-to-date data how do there is a whole lot of uh, cash miss and, and, and cash hit kind of percentage that we look at to form your caching strategy depending on your uh, how often your data store is being kind of updated but this is like i said something that can come later but your understanding is that you can create a memory database as a cache layer keep the most frequent most frequent query ask data there so that you can provide fast response to your client and what kind of cache we have two types of uh, 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 memory uh, a memory data store which is reddish and mem cache and then depending on how you want to whether it's a structured or unstructured data how you want to store them and what kind of a uh, uh, manipulation you want to do on those kind of a uh, uh, cache uh, data you either select reddish or, or mem cache and this is also provided it's also serverless and provide you consistent high performance you know and then that ensures the sub millisecond response that 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 you are looking for fully managed also with it from AWS. So, and these databases are not like you select one or other. You can select as many as your different services require within your application. So, uh, uh, and then I will skip this because it's kind of persistent in memory database from Amazon talking about ultra fast performance. So now, I'm trying to go a little bit fast. So if I'm too fast, please let me know. Uh, uh, I just want some demo from Ursula before we, 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 we kind of finish this session. So um, there is also this notion of a graph database. So it all comes back to the use cases, to the services you want to handle. Sometimes you are really interested in kind of the relationship between your data points or the relationship between your data and how to navigate through those relationships you know and for example i mean uh, social feed like you have the entities or, or at the node like who use this what is this and how that relates to another person so like you have here the social this person like this feed or this person still uses this, this or is friends to this and check into this. And also when you look at application services like recommendation, like the person who purchased this also purchased this. The person who does this or the person who likes this like this. It's all about relationship, uh, uh, building relationship, connecting different activities within your database to each other. And you use a node for the entities or the product, and then you use the, the edge, which is the arrow starting from, has a starting point pointing to the direction. So like if you purchase this product and this and you are related to this uh, uh, sports event, and so you want to build that relationship and to be able to build a recommendation for your service, like web services, or even another thing you can use that for uh, navigating kind of relationship within the data points or data or entities in your store is fraud detection. And you don't want to build that logic during query i mean it will take a lot of computation a lot of time to be able to build all this relationship at the time of query you want a database that has stored this relationship graph and navigation for you and that specific database that's been built to do exactly that 
in the graph database. And Amazon graph database is this uh, Amazon Neptune. And again, this is fully managed graph database. So it means it stores billions of relationships for you. And then you query within millisecond latencies. It does the replication for you across three different uh, AV. Uh, also, I talk about availability, talk about the kind of reliability. How do you make sure that, I mean, you are always have the service, even when something happens, disruption happens in one area or another area. Backup and restore be the last one, but the availability could be that you have different uh, services in different areas, uh, geographical areas, like uh, different availability zone to continue to serve your customers, even if one is down. And this will be done for you with a fully managed graph database. And it uses the popular Sparkle language, easy for you to build wonderful queries, I mean, uh, uh, that link the graphs together. So this is what uh, fully managed database within a, a graph database within. So again, it really depends on your application. Do you need a graph database? Do you need that navigation? Do you need to utilize that? Like the e-commerce application that I said earlier on, the team developing the recommendation. The graph database may be the ideal database for them to build their recommendation kind of a, a app or, or engine on top. Yeah. Any questions? So, and I then think again, there's one question, and I think it's a uh, it's a good one, and I think it's it's something we can investigate together. So, yeah. um, because there's a question of what kind of questions would you ask a customer to get to the bottom of what kind of database model they need if you're thinking about saving huge amount of data from hundreds of sources for a long amount of time, would you re uh, would you recommend relational or non-relational? Yeah, so uh, uh, that is a volume of the data, you know. So you cannot, you have a, you have to ask series of questions. That is the volume of the data, but what kind of data, kind of characteristics? How do you want to assess the data? You know, does the data uh, attribute change over time? So these are the questions you want to ask. Does the data attribute change over the time? Do you have a strict? Uh, do you have to uh, uh, emphasize? Consistency and accuracy strictly on the data. So, so I, I will leave the data aside and then talk about what kind of applications and services you want to use. So once you understand like the assets pattern, I, I want to assess this as fast as possible. I'm not very strict with, with the, the schema. The schema can change, but I want to, and I don't do complex queries, you know, and then you are moving to no SQL. I mean, if consistency is not an issue, because sometimes, uh, uh, consistency if you are doing like transactional applications right like where consistency and, and atomicity is really important then you are moving to relational database so we have so ask a lot of questions about the characteristics of the of, of the data store how you want to assess it the volume and then the data types and also simple data structures or large objects uh, so that you need to ask and also, uh, uh, you want to ask also, do you do the attributes change over time? Do uh, certain things. So uh, I think I will I will I will have a summary the uh, slides that you look at. Please go through all through it and make sure you don't even look at database. Make sure you are looking at the application. What do you want to build? How do you want? To, what questions you want to ask? To the uh, to the data store and what kind of responses you want to get, and how fast, and and then uh, uh, what is important to you? Latency, throughput, you know. Ask those questions, and then when you finish, it will be really clear for you that this is the database. And then as an architect, also you need to also do some trade off. You know, always it might not be really clear, but you might see that oh, seventy percent of the functionality is always in the relational database. I can handle the rest of the distance. With, uh, within the relationship, so you can do that. So please always, the requirement, you, this is what you have to uh, uh, kind of uh, focus on. The database comes later because they are always there. So I hope I've answered the question correctly or, 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 or you are happy with the answer, but please uh, reach out if you want more details. I mean, we can really, really walk through it. And then we have, uh, if I move on, we have one, 
kind of data that we call time series. Time series data, you see it around all the time, all the time. Let's say you have DevOps kind of a, a, a environment or, or infrastructure environment. You have servers, you have clusters of servers, you have servers around the region, and each server runs, you have memory, CPU, and you have workload, and you are taking logs every time within some interval. And these logs are coming every second or every three seconds or every, some interval of time, and you are collecting these logs. How do you store these logs? What do you do with this? Because most of the time, storage is important, but what do you do with the data after you store it? Is it easier to store it this way so that you can manipulate it that way? That's all what you have to think about. And then like we have also IoT sensor readings. Let's say you have a, a common thing like, not common thing, a common thing like a car. You have so many components. And if you are collecting data from all the components within the time you have, within the car, you have like, more than 100 sources of data that are coming at a certain time interval, and they are coming continuously. Now, the question is, how do I store this data? In what, in what format form I store this data? And would that format be able to allow me to do the different manipulations and calculations that I want to do to get inside on that data? And for that, there is a purpose-built time series database to be able to handle this kind of uh, storage, uh, within time interval and manipulation of databases uh, of your data to get inside based on this time intervals or statistical calculation that you may want to do. And for Amazon, the time series database is TimeStream DB. And again, this is serverless. And this scale. So let me, uh, I think this is important for IoT because uh, let me just spend two, three seconds or two minutes on this uh, time stream DB the architecture. So for Amazon Time Street DB, it's a Time Street database that has been built in three layers because of what we've seen as the demand of a time series uh, uh, kind of data in IoT and operational application. So we have the ingestion layer, which is serverless, but decoupled from the storage layer. The storage layer is also serverless, but also decoupled from the ingestion layer and also decoupled from the query layer. And we have a query layer which is also serverless and also decoupled. So it's one table or one DB, but with different layers, which are dif differently kind of, which can scale differently serverless. What that means is that you don't compute on resources when you are getting like millions of data per second and you are trying to query thousands of query on the query layer. There's no compute, there's no computing on any compute resources for you. And that allows you to have a consistent performance for your time series database, for your time series calculation, for your insight that you want, which is very critical when you are looking at IoT and operational application. So this is the fundamental architecture for this time series DB from AWS. Um, so what it is, I mean, you can process trillions of daily events. I mean, it's capable of daily, and it's adaptive query processes engine. So that means you can keep the same performance, whether you are getting million requests per, uh, whether you are making million queries per, per second or 100. If you want the performance, it will adapt, keep the performance by taking the large query that you want to do. And then it's serverless and it's, uh, and it's also optimized as a lot of inbuilt time series calculation analytics inside like this, time window analysis. So this is actually built for you. Simple application and you can run a lot of time series analytics. You don't have to build complex application like using the relational data to be able to handle your time series data. So I think this is that ledger. Uh, any question on time series, uh, uh, on time stream DB? I emphasize on this because apart from DynamoDB, this is what I, I think will be one of the popular database you kind of encounter because of IoT and operational application. And, and, and the one, we talk about one key element, constant element in time series database is the timestamp. Every data, every measure you put in the data has to have a timestamp. It must have a timestamp. So yeah, all right. 
So this is a ledger. Ledger mostly is kind of a, a database or, or, or the concept where your changes are immutable and you cannot modify or update it. And then you can have uh, everything is encrypted that you can be able to query the history of all the activities that you've done on your data from when, they, when you created the data. And this probably is an application that, for example, in the hospitals, patient data going through different department or, 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 or treatment data, anybody that touches it leaves a mark and that cannot be deleted, that cannot be uh, modified. Or in the financial industry where every action that you, you do on specific data has to be recorded for regulatory reason and should not be modified. And this kind of data structure allows you like uh, it protects you with a sharp 25 uh, 256 encryption so that you have this. Uh, uh, so for example, this one, the first update is locked here. I mean, you cannot change or modify the second update. So it builds on it. And if you want that type of database, we have Amazon uh, Quantum Ledger database, which is also fully managed. Crypto, cryptographically variable, but also have, gives you this uh, high scale kind of uh, 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 ability to be able to run your database on this. Uh, and the most important is it's immutable. It's immutable. So you have to kind of, you cannot change the sequence of the record. You cannot update it, you cannot modify it. And that is for regulatory reasons or for any other reasons that you may need. Again, from your application and from your services the requirement that will come. And this is the database that we use. So I get, I hope I'm, 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 I'm still on time, but not too fast. Uh, so the question that was asked earlier on, I, I think uh, this is a slice that kind of, uh, you have to kind of consult to uh, when you are looking at what is the best practices in building databases, purpose-built databases, you know, and in this slides, I mean, structure of your data, data consistency and durability, but durability here will mean loss of data, you know, or, and then the, there is also availability where are you able to assess your data where you want to, right? And then the data modeling. Don't start the data modeling from the database. Look at your application. What kind of data are you, are you going to interact with? Are you going to deal with? Are they document type of data? Are they flat data? And they so always look at what kind of data, is it time series data you'll be handling with? So the data modeling is very important. Also the access pattern. Are you, you know, like in Dynamo where most of the web application is just key value. You want to, what is the key? And then you, uh, you are looking for the value of the key. And in that kind of uh, 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 data types, you know what kind of database, how to store the data to be able to support that application. Always think about it. if you are looking for full search, then you are really looking for this is elastic search kind of uh, data store, you know. And then what kind of queries? And then you also look at does your access pattern changes over time, you know? I, I haven't put anything here like a deployment aspect like scalability, like a, okay the durability, like availability, like the performance, but these are something in addition that you look at what are the deployments it is so that will go serverless or you want to provision it yourself. And then the performance, is there a concurrency you want to have a, we haven't talked about Redshift here, but you know, we talk about database that has can handle concurrency or is it a transactional kind of database. So these are the questions, just go through them and then focus on the other side, the application and service that you are building. Go through them, how, what are the questions I want to ask from uh, the database? What are the interactions I want to interact? How do I want to store my data? How do I want to get my data? And what is the, is, is, is eventual consistency or is this strong consistency important for my business case? You know, I mean, so these are the things you ask and then slowly, slowly, you will see that, hey, this database meet more of my requirement than any other database now. And I want to emphasize, in any application, you can use as many databases as you want, depending on what are the microservices you want to build for the application and what is the need of those microservices. Yeah. And I think um, 
I'm uh, still I have two minutes left. <laughs> so in summary, I can, these are kind of uh, the different purpose-built databases that I can show you now and they are growing. And below, you can see the common use cases that you look at, oh, these are use cases that best fit this kind of database type to use. Then again, as an architect, you always have to look at it, do your trade-off and add the, the operational part, the deployment part as part of it, you know, scaling in, scaling out, kind of deployment, multi-V and global. You also have to add that one part, uh, part as part of your questions to see how these things will be deployed. Any questions? I think I'm pretty fast, <laughs> 11.45. So any questions? So I'll leave it to Ursula to kind of demo, uh, give you a quick demo. It looks like we don't have questions in the chat. Please feel, feel free to add them. Um, I was thinking what I could do. I could just demo you a bit uh, what it's like to build a database in the cloud. And, and if you have any questions, add them to the chat. And also you can unmute yourself when we get to the end and also ask questions that way. Um, if I share my screen... And let's go and look at the console a bit. I think it should be this one. Uh, do you see my browser? You yes. should be, yeah, nice. So um, let me talk through a couple of services and, and because we, of course, we don't have time to do all of them right now, but. So once you have made up your mind that I'm going to go to the direction of relational databases, or I'm going to go to direction of a NoSQL or non-relational, and I have specific product in mind. So when you log on to your uh, AWS account, one thing that keep in mind when you start building this also in the immersion days uh, is the fact that now we have different levels of services. So if you remember from the from the uh, fundamental piece of, of the trainings, you have global services, you have uh, regional services, and then you have something called zonal services and zonal meaning availability zone specific services. And in the context of databases, for example, if you look at the services like uh, DynamoDB, Let's take it as an example. So when you look at that and you start building, uh, you can actually get into a global context. But for example, when you look at like a specific database machine, which is a relational database machine, we start with something that is zonal and we can grow it out from zonal to go to regional, from regional to even global in a certain design patterns. So it depends what you're building. So you need to understand also in which context your services are operating in. So, um, and why is it important? So let me go to my main view. Something to look out for. I'm in Stockholm right now. If I'm starting to build a relational database, this is happening in Stockholm. So uh, if I go to relational database service or RDS, if I click on RDS, you will see the databases that I have running in Stockholm. And in this context, let me open it up. Uh, for example, now you can see that I have five database instances running right now which are divided between database clusters. And if I click on the database instances, you can actually see that there's a column called regional and availability zone. So uh, context is Stockholm and region and availability zone is mentioned in the column below. So those are also decisions that you have to make when you're building out those databases. Let me demo something quickly and let's talk about also how it affects cost. And then in the immersion days, you get to try these out yourself. So let me say I want to build a new database. So we have made a decision that it will be a relational database. So I'm building something new. And when I start building, 
the create database will ask me in the RDS context, a lot of questions. What is the engine type? What is the relational database engine type? So for example, are you going to go with Amazon Aurora? Are you going to go specifically MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server? What you need to keep in mind, Amazon Aurora actually holds both MySQL and Postgres flavors underneath it also. These ones are specifically then standalone uh, or clustered versions of those databases. But let's say I'm building a relational database which is built from scratch, a new one. It's going to be an Amazon Aurora. I wanna have that split between the storage layers, layer scalability and also the front end scalability. And I'm going to actually choose here what is the compatibility compatibility of that engine? So I'm going to do a Aurora that is Postgres SQL compatible. Um, <clears throat> there's also a lot of sub questions that you can go through when you're deciding on what the engine is. So for example, if you have coders who are much more used to using Postgres, that could be an indicator that you might prefer Postgres. Or uh, if you have uh, performance tuning, uh, capabilities in your group that prefer MySQL, then it might be an indication that you prefer MySQL. Sometimes there's also a financial indicator. Why would you choose something? And then I can choose which version of the engine I will use. So I can actually choose, in this context, I'm building something completely new. So I will choose the newest version that I have in the list that I've been using now. And then I can also say uh, I could use completely a serverless version of Amazon Aurora. And that means I can actually scale it in even smaller pieces. So the separation between storage and front end is even heavier. Uh, at the moment, I will just create, it's not a serverless what I'm creating. Um, this is completely something that you also need to understand what features it entails. And we can take a separate session on that. And then I can actually choose, there's also a regional possibility to create a regional and even a globally spanning database. So I could actually switch those features on if I like to, but I'm, I'm skipping those for now. Templates that I'm going to use include parameters for production and development and testing. So more robust are under production and the lighter versions and also the cheaper versions are under de development and testing. Uh, if I'm building production, let's look at how it affects pricing. So I will give the database a name. Um, let's say inspiration database 2023. And then I will give the database master username. So for Postgres, the default username is Postgres. You can also decide to change it to something else. You can decide to auto generate a database password, or you can actually create it on your own and you have constraints that it has to be ASCII characters, it can't contain slash, single quotes, double quotes, at signs, etc. Uh, or you can let it auto generate so you will get a splash where you where you see what the password is. What will affect the pricing is what kinds of instances you will use in order to build your database. So we have different kinds of database uh, uh, instance types. We have memory optimized classes and we have so-called burstable classes. And all of these have different features when it comes to amount of CPUs, amount of memory and the um, uh, network penetration rate. So how fast is the network connectivity? What you need to keep in mind, you can scale this up. So you don't have to start with the largest of the sizes, the instance classes. You can actually um, scale those later on. So what I would do when I'm starting a project, I would start with the estimate what I have for my environment. I would performance test it. If I need more, I can scale it up. I can also scale it down if needed. So let me choose something. And also there are all the generation uh, instance types if, if I wanna include those to the list. But let me start with two CPU, 16 gigs of RAM and network penetration of, uh, and, and then I have a basic setup uh, built. 
What will also affect the price of your instance is will you deploy in multi-AC, meaning that will you have a copy of the environment in two or more availability zones? So you remember you can have 16 instances spread across, but every one of those will have a, a price point. So it will affect the price. So let's say if create an Aurora replica or a reader node in a different AC, this will have a price point. If I say don't do that, it will be lower in price. So if I will do this, we can have a look what it will cost. And then I can actually build already out different compute resources uh, when it relates to networking. So I can say that I have ready-made compute resources that can be in the connected, or I can actually set up those rules afterwards. Then I need to choose in which network, in which private cloud network this uh, database, database will reside in. And um, you see that it says after a database is created, you can change its VPC. Uh, it's not set in stone in ways that if you decide to move it in a different VPC, you can actually restore it in different VPC. So it's not like fixed that way, but it's fixed that you can bounce it around easily. So you can choose the network and actually I have a Mimit Coda VPC. I can choose to use this one. And then I can choose which subnet I will place it in. Will it have a public access? So will it have public accessibility from external sources? Most likely, no. So most likely you will not expose your database to public access. And do you want to use a security group that you have? Or do you want to use a new security group? I actually have a security group built for me with Coda. And I will use that one if I can just select it and then I will remove the default one. I do have some additional configuration. So for example, which database port the database will listen to, I can change it to a custom one. But if I'm changing it to a custom one, I need to change my security group settings because it's open for that port currently. Um, yeah, I can add functionalities, features, um, if needed, and I can also decide how to do the, do the database authentication layer. If I want to integrate it with um, identity and access control mechanisms, Kerberos, etc., and then will I want to use monitoring settings? So, for example, performance insights and for how long? So, for example, seven days is a free tier feature. If I want to add more, it will incur a cost. So if I add one month of performance insights, it will incur more cost. Uh, what am I using for key capabilities? And um, can I change the keys after if I enable performance insights? I cannot. And um, then, then I actually do see uh, what I have right now. So what I have actually built right now before I start actually deploying it live. So let me see what I have. So I have actually, let me see, additional configuration database options. Um, and then I can actually choose if I wanna add a maintenance window. So maintenance window, meaning that maintenance window of when are those typical maintenance tasks like patching and upgrading run. And I can choose a date and I can choose a start time uh, preference and typical duration that I have the maintenance window running for. Is it fixed in stone? No, but that's the preference that I have. And I can also, because it's a production database, in this context, I'm creating a production database. If I enable deletion protection, if it's the last node standing, it will not allow me to delete it without actually saying that I know I'm deleting the last node. So it's a protection against like, oops, that was the wrong database. And once I get to the point of, yes, this is what I'm building, this is what I'm actually going to deploy, I can decide to start actually deploying it. I can start uh, provisioning it.
And now that I'm doing a multi AC, let me go back. I think I did choose the multi AC. Uh, that means that I will have a main writer node and a secondary reader node in different AC. So once I choose to create, let's see if it allows me to create, because if I haven't chosen all the necessary option, it, it actually may fail and say, so sorry, you haven't actually set up this feature yet. And it starts creating and you can actually monitor its creation. Uh, you can see that there's an inspiration database under being created but it will take a while. So it will create it, it will give you the password, it will actually have your setup. But let's have a look if I take something that is already ready-made. So I have, let's take the mimitco.demo one. This is also Postgres SQL Amazon Aurora. So if I open this one and have a look so I can see the endpoints that I have, I have the readers and writers, I have the monitoring data, and I can actually scroll to, through those and see how the CP utilization is going, what kinds of connectivity is currently running. Right now, none, because nobody's using it today. And then I can go to look and events, maintenance and backups and see what's going on in there. And anything that I have running in there, I can actually decide to do patching upgrades, et cetera, from directly from the user interface. I can also see which snapshots, which backups do I have, and what is the latest restore time that I can get to. So for example, now, today, uh, it's actually UTC time. So actually the latest backup time that I could get to is about five minutes, uh, uh, from this moment. And I can see my backup windows and I can see tags, etc. And of course I can do activities. I can, for example, say that I need to fail over from my primary to my secondary, which is my reader node. I can upgrade it. I can take a manual snapshot. I can reboot it if there's something going on or if I change my parameters. So I can do most of the uh, admin stuff here, but also if you're thinking now that I've used Postgres in the in the past, can I use my like my Postgres admin tools? Yes, you can. So you can have your uh, connectivity wired from your laptop in ways that you have the access to those endpoints and do the management stuff that I, you have used in the past. All the clients work, all the tools work that you have used in the past. Your SQL tools work. So there's nothing you couldn't actually use in here. So you can happily use them still. Um, that's a very, very short demo. I, I know that we are now out of time. So I will actually stop here and I will share my slide. So you should be able to see my slide, uh, which is the last slide. So a couple of things <clears throat> before we wrap up. So if there are open questions, let's take those ones. Um, we are very happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. So please don't feel threatened. Or, so it's a low threshold to, to uh, have contact with us, also ask questions. So please do ask questions. Um, would love to get your feedback on if there's something you would like to see us do differently. Uh, that's also very much welcomed. And um, the next immersion day hopefully will get set up now for the 3rd of November. That will be a generic one. You will see also specialized one set up for databases, DevOps, and there will be a serverless uh, immersion day. And uh, I think with that, um, I will say thank you. And any questions, any questions that you wanna have us cover before we wrap up for today? It doesn't look like we're getting any questions. <laughs> cool, thank you so much. So if no more questions, uh, thank you. Have a great day. Uh, we will be staying in the room for a moment. So so if there's something you wanna ask, please stay, stay here and ask a question. You can also unmute yourself and thank you.